Welcome to September and welcome back to Subversive Preacher. My name is Cameron Miller. Uh, and this is a sermon or reflection for the 15th Sunday of Pentecost. And i got a couple readings I'm going to share with you. I don't have them to put up on the screen, but you can always look them up and read them. The first one is uh, The Settlement by Mary Oliver. And it goes like this. Look, it's spring. And last year's loose dust has turned into this soft willingness. The wind flowers have come up trembling. Slowly the black the brackens are uplifting their curvaceous and pale bodies. The thrushes have come home, none less than filled with mystery, sorrow, happiness, music, ambition. And I am walking out unto all this with nowhere to go and no task undertaken but to turn the pages of this beautiful world over and over in the world of my mind. Therefore, dark past, I'm about to do it. I'm about to forgive you for everything. And then this is a text from uh, pointed for the 15th Sunday of Pentecost from Matthew. It's Matthew 18, 15 through 20. And it goes like this. Jesus said, if another member of the church sins against you, go and point out the fault when the two of you are alone. If the member listens to you, you have regained that one. But if you are not listened to, take one or two others along with you, so that every word may be confirmed by the evidence of two or three witnesses. If the member refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if the offender refuses to listen even to the church, let such a one be to you as a Gentile and tax collector. Truly, I tell you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Again, truly I tell you, if two of you agree on earth about anything you ask, it will be done for you by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered in my name, I am there among them. So, just a word of warning. If we are to come at somebody with two witnesses and start accusing them of having done something wrong, that accused person is going to clam up, get defensive, get spitting mad. Good luck with that method of reconciliation. <laughs> oh, and, and the tribunals of the church have, uh, have a lovely history of ferreting out guilt and innocence, like drowning people to see if they really are a witch, because, of course, witches don't drown. Oops, I guess she wasn't a witch. This little well-trodden story is more, uh, of a math, it was more of a Matthew than a Jesus gem, for sure. And here's the clue, where it says, If the offender refuses to listen even to the church, let such a one be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. Well, first of all, Jesus was pals with Gentiles and tax collectors, and he treated them like everyone else. And secondly, the word church, ecclesia, in Jesus' day meant simply an assembly or a gathering rather than a Christian, con than the Christian connotation it came, up, came to have a half a century later in Matthew's day. So this is one of those Times and I'm going to say goodbye to the text because it wanders already far away from the teachings of Rabbi Jesus. And I'm not being critical of Matthew that there, because there are surely historic reasons for him to render the text as he did. I've delved into the history of that before when it's come up in the past lectionaries and I'm, I'm sure that you remember those sermons three and six years ago. But to be fair, Matthew's story about Jesus telling Peter how to resolve alienation may work out well between individuals within relatively equal power relationships and maybe even within a family. But it probably is not a great idea within an institution that has a hierarchy. 
But this, this story from Matthew about forgiveness, as in Mary Oliver's poem, and the truth is, in the church, we're no better at talking honestly about forgiveness than we are exploring sex. We idealize the one, and we ignore and fret about the other. For from what I can tell, both from my own experience and from having been privy to the experiences of many others, the way we think about forgiveness and the way that we describe it, well, it just doesn't really exist. Where an injury or a violation is deep or severe or violent, our fantastical Christian notions of forgiveness are just not real. Forgiveness is not something that happens. It's not a point on the horizon that we arrive at and then we have forgiven someone or someone then receives forgiveness from us. Rather, forgiveness is a process. It, it meanders and it never really ends. Forgiveness is not a state of being that is once and for all what it is. It rather ebbs and flows. In fact, forgiveness looks and feels a lot different in different times and places, just as memory is modified by time and circumstance. Forgiveness has the wobbly legs of a toddler learning to walk. The babe forgets one day's progress into the next and crawls again on the way to remembering that he or she has taken steps. Well, forgiveness is likewise up and down and full and anemic and restful and anxious and calm and festering. When the wound is severe or the alienation is deep and painful, forgiveness is not a happy ever after ending. Rather, it's a process of learning and knitting and unraveling and gathering up and quilting. It's just like a poem or cathedral. Forgiveness is never complete, never done once and for all, not when the injury or the fracture has been profound. Forgiveness and reconciliation, they, as I said, meander and flow and evolve over time rather than coming to a final end. And you know what? That, that is its power. So long as we remain open in the process of forgiveness and reconciliation, they have the potential to continue healing in new, new and profound ways, totally unexpected. When we wash our hands of forgiveness, though, and we pretend it's done and over and never to have to go there again, well, we lose the potential for ongoing gifts of healing. Because healing itself, of course, is a process. It's a never-ending and evolving process. And that is its power, too. So the goal is not to forgive and forget. The task is to remember and to work at learning and to gain perspective. But most of all, forgiveness is not a gift given to the offender. It's a work of healing given to oneself. I don't forgive you for what you did to me. I work at healing it so that it does not continue to wound me. What you do with the aftermath, disruption, and sometimes evil of your actions in wounding me, well, that's your business to deal with. That's your woundedness to heal. That's what Mary Oliver's poem is getting at, I think, when she she talks to the past darkness. Sometimes, sometimes it's very helpful to think about the opposite of something when we are trying to understand it. So the opposite of forgiveness is useful to think about. Holding our wounds and protecting them from healing is resentment. The opposite of forgiveness is resentment. The French root of the word resentment means to refeel, to rethink. So wounds that we do not submit to a healing process, they're, they're kept alive by refeeling them and, and rethinking them over and over and over and over and over again. 
It hurts so good and we enjoy the resentment so much. And why? Why would we choose to keep a wound alive rather than engage in a healing process? Is it because we're so wounded we can't believe in healing ever? Do we relish the vengeance and the hate and hate mercy that much? Here's what I think. And maybe this is because I'm fresh off the knee replacement and obviously still rehabbing from it. But hurt heals. Hurt heals. It is, a, it is painful to engage in the healing of any wound, whatever and whoever the source. In order to heal, though, we have to enter the wound and be vulnerable to it again. For instance, I have to keep stretching the muscles and the tendons that recoiled in my knee surgery. And if I do not keep stretching and pulling and exercising them, they will be forever shrunken, tight, and brittle. It hurts to heal. And sometimes we would rather resent we feel the injury and stir the bile of, re of resentment. We'd rather be bitter than hurt. Well, recognizing and acknowledging that to forgive is our work and for our own well-being, not something that we give or do for the offender, robs us of hatred and it robs us of blame and it robs us of vengeance. So, some people choose to build a moat around their wound and to not engage in healing. Instead, they suck on bitterness and keep the wound festering. And it's absolutely self-destructive. And that does nothing for the offender. But I shouldn't end without also acknowledging that there is, of course, a kind of transactional forgiveness. A student loan is forgiven. A penitent receives absolution after confession. I'm sorry, I forgot the mayonnaise. That's okay, you're forgiven. But the kind of forgiveness that matters most and is hardest to come by in a healing process is, it, is the one that we engage in for ourselves, for ourselves and for no one else. And it... It has a, a whole field of gifts unknown to us until we encounter them. That's the power of continuing to being in a healing process, of entering into the process of forgiveness. That's all I got. Except to wish you peace. Thanks for being back.